And joining us now to talk much more about this is Liz Kennedy from our good friends over at Demos, a nonpartisan public policy research and advocacy group here, who along with the folks over at Common Cause put a report together titled Bullies at the Ballot Box, they examine this issue, and they really talk about the attempt to protect the freedom of folks to vote against wrongful challenges and intimidation. Liz, thanks a lot for a few minutes. I appreciate it. Thanks, Richard. Great to be joining you. Well, before we talk about what's going on on the ground and the concerns in 40 some odd days with the election, let's talk about the why. Why all of a sudden this newfound attempt, whether through legislative efforts like voter ID laws and some of these groups whose sole intention is to go police the ballot boxes, why all of a sudden now? Is there massive fraud here that we've discovered? Uh, no, of course not. Um, no matter how many attempts there are to find this kind of voter fraud, we have not uh, been able to see any evidence of voter fraud. We have, in fact, through many of these court cases that have overturned a lot of these restrictive voter laws, seen that no fraud can really be found or proven. Um, however, there has been a very concerted effort uh, last year and now this year uh, to manipulate voter pools, um, and that is something that we are paying a lot of attention to uh, and trying to push back at to make sure every eligible American can cast their ballot and have it counted this fall. We gave a very brief snapshot, um, Liz, to our audience about what's going on across the country, but also through organizations like True the Vote, it seems, whether you look from East Coast to West Coast and all points in between, a lot of states have been gearing up for this election, and if folks think that it's going to be like any other election, they may be surprised here. Talk about what is going on, how the courts are now figuring out where the limits are, whether it's legal, um, what kind of oversight needs to happen. And these organizations, like you guys talked about True the Vote, whose intention it is, is to make it as difficult as possible, seemingly, for folks to try and cast a ballot. Well, you know, Richard, I think that uh we put this report together in order to give tools to voters um, and to call on elected officials and law enforcement to be able to monitor the polls and make sure that no positive civic engagement crosses the line into voter intimidation and harassment. And our point is not uh, that people ought not to be involved in the election process, uh, but rather that when organizations are suggesting that they're going to recruit and train a million poll watchers and they are these volunteers are being told that the election is going to be stolen by a, quote, food stamp army, uh, and that their intent is to make voting like driving and seeing the police following you. That is where we worry uh, that, in fact, certain populations will be targeted. And in the past, in the past few years, we have seen certain tar uh, populations targeted rather than others, such as students, such as voters in uh, communities of color. Um, we've seen uh, lists made of folks that might be in foreclosure proceedings. Um, and that is the kind of uh, illegitimate choosing which voters are ostensibly somehow better than others uh, that we think is really problematic and goes against the grain of what it is to vote in America, where it's our civic duty and our responsibility to participate in this process. We should be making it easier for every eligible American to do so rather than um, potentially building up, uh, making it problematic for folks to do so. Is this just coincidental, Liz? Call me a cynic, but it seems that all of a sudden, in one election, this is happening all over the place. Are these efforts coordinated? Who's behind here this new uh, outreach and these new efforts to make it more and more difficult than ever before to vote? Uh, well, you know, I think there's been a lot of good coverage. Um, the New York Times have, have, of course, done several large articles in the last few weeks connecting the dots between um, some of these organizations. I mean, it's not our goal to... Uh, discuss any kind of, of partisan uh, outcome determinative goals that some of these folks might have. Uh, we just want to make sure that every eligible American is able to vote and that elections are free, fair, and accessible for everyone. Um, our difficulty here is that we've seen in elections in last year and in this year that what could be positive civic engagement has crossed the line into 
uh, potentially voter harassment and, in fact, intimidation. In Wisconsin, we saw the Wisconsin General uh, Accountability Board say that they were seeing um, people at the polls engage in illegal behavior. Uh, we've seen reports that voters are being hovered over. Um, just this week in Ohio, over 300 uh, voter challenges were thrown out by the Franklin County Board of Elections. Um, and these you know, boards of elections are really having to deal with a bunch of pre-election challenges that are taking their attention away from getting ready to run these elections. So the problem is both that these challenges, which can happen before and on election day, uh, both might uh, make it more difficult for an, an individual who is challenged to vote, but then may also make it more difficult for the rest of us that are engaged in voting and for election administrators that are trying to, you know, run uh, fair and, um, you know, uh, efficient elections. Uh, and I think for those of us who care about having a fair result that reflects the legitimate choice of all eligible Americans, we need to make sure that poll workers are trained so they know how to resolve any of these challenges. Uh, they need to know that there are laws on the books, both federal and state laws, against voter intimidation, and that there are really tools here for voters. There are there are hotlines for voters that they can call. Uh, 866-OUR-VOTE is a bunch of nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, poll, you know, poll monitors that can help if voters are seeing this kind of bullying. So our goal here is to just get tools out to as many people so they know that we have their back when they go to participate in our democratic process. Well, Liz, help me out, because I know in your report you looked at 10 states in particular. Where should we keep an eye on on election night here that there may be some troubles? And also, can you clear up for us what's legal and what's not legal in terms of when somebody tries to cast a vote, what could someone do that is protected by law and what's crossing the line that goes into harassment? Sure. So one reason why, uh, you know, we, we looked at the laws in 10 states, as you say, that govern who can challenge voters before and on election day, uh, and then the rules governing the behavior of poll watchers. Um, I'm afraid that these are these laws are state-based, so they do change state to state, uh, which is why it is difficult to say what is allowed um, across the board. It is, however, very important to be clear that voter intimidation is illegal in any state uh, because it is prohibited by the Voting Rights Act. Uh, so federal, there are federal protections against voter intimidation. In many states, um, there are also anti-intimidation laws, um, some of which are stronger than others. But for example, in Ohio, uh, a state that in the past has had problems with election day challenges by partisan players, um, Ohio then uh, worked to improve its voter protections. And now no voter in Ohio can be challenged on election day except by an election official. So that ought to protect, uh, give a lot of protection to voters because it ought to guard against frivolous challenges. Uh, unfortunately, for example, in Pennsylvania, um, they have very few substantive restrictions on poll watchers. Um, it's good to know that in states like Texas, there actually are substantive restrictions on poll watchers. They ought not to be able to um, really talk to any voter or photograph or video voters. Uh, and so there, it's a question of making sure that these voter protections are enforced. Uh, and so we know that folks across the country are working to bring these potential concerns to the attention of election officials uh, to make sure that those laws are understood and enforced. One thing I got from your report was it's not just that Tuesday in November that this is going to play out. Forget what's going on even in the courts. There are challenges and intimidation that are happening right as we speak and will ramp up, one would assume here, until November when people vote. So this is happening both before and on Election Day that we're seeing this play out, correct? Yes, that is the case, Richard. In many states, you are able to challenge a voter's eligibility to vote prior to Election Day. Some states do a very good job of setting a uh, time limit prior to Election Day when pre-Election Day challenges have to be made. So those, uh, in, and, and it's typically at least 30 days before an election. So those pre-Election Day challenges um, ought to be tapering off as we get closer and closer to the election. Um, what's important, I think, for everyone to recognize here is that what we're talking about is registered voters who are currently on the lists uh, and who will
people you know, show up in the fall expecting to be able to cast their ballots. Uh, and yet we've seen that some of these organizations who profess to care about voter integrity um, running their own proprietary software and then submitting large scale uh, lists of names to boards of elections or to secretaries of state um, suggesting that all of these people are somehow suspect and that their eligibility should be further probed. But of course, it's really dangerous territory when you get into a position where lists of voters are being made and then are going to be potentially stricken off the rolls. I know, you know many uh, lists that have been created thus far have been shown to be absolutely inaccurate. For example, in Florida, we you know, saw that over 180,000 voters were on a list that the prior Florida Secretary of State refused to go forward with because he recognized that they really hadn't you know, cross their T's and dotted their I's. Uh, when the county officials received those lists and were expected to move forward with checking uh, and, and potentially striking some of these voters from the laws, they refused as well in that they found that the data was just not of a sufficiently high quality to be able to really cast doubt as to whether these registered voters uh, were actually potentially ineligible. So really the point is we should making it we should be making it easier and facilitating the right of every eligible American uh, to cast a vote that should be counted. Uh, you know, we should be lowering the burdens on the vote um, and the barriers for people to get involved in choosing our elected government. Um, instead, we're seeing uh, that some voters may be, you know, some folks are trying to catch up some voters in a bunch of red tape, uh, and we think that's the wrong direction. You know, one of the constant arguments is, my gosh, is it so much to ask for that someone's got a photo ID? Uh, you got to have a photo ID to get on a plane here. ID is required to get into buildings. Um, to vote uh, with all the importance attached to it, that's not too much to ask for. What's the answer to that question? You know, it is, there is a lot of uh, people of goodwill who have a certain common sense idea that, you know, as you said, shouldn't this be reasonable? But the point is that. 20 million Americans do not have the kind of ID uh, that is being required uh, to vote. In Pennsylvania, just this week, they are rehearing um, their Pennsylvania very strict uh, voter ID laws uh, to see if they will be able to get that system up and ready. Because what we're talking about is not, you know, if somebody forgets their ID when they run out to the corner to buy a beer, that's just not really burdening something that is so important to their lives. Uh, but when we are, when politicians and government are actually overburdening somebody's right to vote because they don't have that ID, that really is uh, taking away a fundamental right, which is at the basis of all of our other American rights. Uh, so that is really a problem. We've seen that in Pennsylvania, 750,000 eligible registered voters do not have the form of ID that Pennsylvania would require you to have in order to cast a ballot in the fall. That's just not an acceptable answer to what, of course, is actually a phantom problem. Um, so while, you know, and then, of course, it's really a question of it's the current politicians that are choosing which form of IDs may or may not be acceptable. So when some of these states have, have adopted these ID laws, they've decided that hunting permits are okay, but student IDs aren't. Uh, so we really want to be very careful when we're talking about laws that are manipulating the voting pools to choose certain voters that may be somehow more eligible or better able uh, to choose our government. That is really an un-American uh, way to go on this. Um, and so it's much better if we stick to the requirements of our current system, which is that you have to be an eligible American to register to vote. The, you know, the boards of elections vet these registrations. Uh, and we've not had problems with this um, in the past, and we won't be having problems with this going forward. Uh, we're concerned with making, with fighting back against voter fraud, which to us means making sure every eligible American can cast a vote that will be counted. Last question for me, Liz, and that is obviously um, we all, you know, get that uh, uh, sickening feeling when you remember about the hanging chads and what happened back in 2000. No one wants a repeat of that and what went up to the high court. But you've been pouring through this with the folks in Common Cause. There's a lot more states in play with a lot more open-ended questions. How big an impact could this issue have 
Could we be talking about this on the Wednesday after the Tuesday night election about, wait a minute, all of a sudden we've got lawsuits and challenges the day after. Are we headed for a potential mess like that? Yeah, Richard, I think that you raise a very important and scary point, and that's why we should all take the next 40 days to do as much as we can uh, to ensure that there is a fair, legitimate result on that Tuesday in November uh, that reflects the choices of all eligible Americans. Um, you know, the fact that so many that we're still seeing voting uh, requirements in flux, uh, so close, of course, the, the South Carolina uh, photo ID case is also um, still to be decided. Uh, Pennsylvania, there'll be a decision on that by October 2nd. Uh, and then, of course, this question about the challenges. Um, there are still uh, reams of data and thousands of names that are being submitted. Um, these are folks who may very well show up in November to find that their names have been stricken from the list through no fault of their own. You know, in, in, in the spring, former Congressman Lincoln Davis from Tennessee went to vote, found his name had been stricken from the list. Uh, if it can happen to a former congressman, it can happen to anyone. And that is not the way that we should be running our system. So moving forward, we should really talk about all of the very easy, very common sense uh, solutions to some of our larger problems, for example, allowing folks to register and vote on the very same day. That would uh, allow many people to um, not have to run into a problem where their names have been stricken from a list. But I think that the challenger question, particularly on Election Day, is really going to be uh, a wild card. We do not want to have a situation where uh, communities of colors are, are being targeted uh, by challengers who have been fed rhetoric that says that a food stamp army is trying to steal this election. Uh, you know, households, 1.5 million households uh, with a military veteran currently receive food stamps. And I ask you, are those the people that we are suggesting no longer are the, the cream of the crop with the American voter? Uh, we've, 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 we've moved away from that in the last 40 years, thank goodness. Uh, and I don't think that we should be moving back. So hopefully um, we'll, you know, we're trying to raise this, the level of the, of the conversation about this so that we can implement some solutions before Election Day. Uh, and, you know, we're hopefully going to be working with election officials in a lot of these states and with law enforcement nationally uh, to make sure that any kind of positive civic engagement does not cross the line because we will tolerate no bullying at the ballot box. And the report again is titled, just as Liz just said, Bullies at the Ballot Box. Uh, we have uh, linked it uh, to our site here so you can check it out. It's a very interesting report. Liz Kennedy, thank you so much. I appreciate a few minutes. Thanks, Rich. Have a great night.